and I'm very happy to have uh, Colin Gunner here. Uh, he's a neurologist with um, a specialty in movement disorders, and not only Parkinson, also other diseases. And uh, exceptional is that he's a neurologist who had a PhD on the field of larynx diseases. <laughs> so therefore, um, he is um, the person that can open our view uh, on line shield dystonias because usually we look inside our scope and see only the left or the right vocal fold, but we don't see what's happened in the neck, what is uh, in the brain, what's in the whole body of our patients. So um, be careful. This is a whole body disease. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here and I thank you very much for the kind invitation and to talk today. So I'm going to divide my talk into two parts. I'm first going to give you an idea about uh, focal dystonias and dystonias in general, and then I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into um, laryngeal dysfunction and, uh, and movement disorders. And um, as you already said, um, everybody starts here in that course, and so did I in 2016. <laughs> uh, I just put those photos in. Uh, so this is what you're going to... Um, Want to be experiencing tomorrow, just a quick preview, but that was in 2016 when I was here, and so and now I'm here to present. So I'm sure if, uh, one of you guys will be here within the next couple of years. So when we talk about focal dystonia, um, I want to talk, I want to show you the most prevalent focal dystonia, which is um, blepharospasm. This is, um, and you're going to see a lot of videos with different phenotypical presentations. On the right side, you see the guy has trouble opening his eyes. And um, on the left eye, uh, on the left, uh, on the right side, um, is a so-called inhibitory type blepharospasm, whereas the guy on the left side has an occlusive blepharospasm. There's two different types, and um, which uh, both contribute to um, the, closure, the closure of the eyes. And uh, another focal dystonia, um, you can appreciate in this gentleman. You see his writing, and uh, you have a dystonic extension of his index finger and his thumb, which significantly interferes with uh, his writing. And this is called writer's cramp. And uh, this is the second most prevalent uh, focal dystonia. And it's a task specific dystonia because the dystonic posturing only appears while the patient is writing. And we write a lot, everybody writes a lot. And so this is quite a uh, quite a prevalent uh, manifestation of a focal task specific dystonia. And there's a, a variety of phenotypes. You can have um, um, dystonic extension of the fingers, you can have sonic cramping of the fingers, you can have on the right side, you see the zigzag lines uh, of the. Whoop. Ah, here. Yeah. And the laser pointer. There we go. So you can see the zigzag lines. And um, which are a tremulous form of writer's cramp that can also also interfere. And what is typical is that when patients put the finger in their hand and then the hand touches the paper, that's when the dystonic posturing starts. So you need to have a certain sensory input, and this sensory input then has an overflow reaction with a dystonic cramp of the muscles. So it's always linked to a um, to a uh, sensory input, this dystonic output. And, and there's another uh, task specific. Where's, where's the dystonia? It's not that she repeats the song uh, over and over again. Can you see the dystonia? I'll play it again. Index finger, very good. Yes. So there's a certain movement her right index finger and her thumb extend, and that interferes with her playing the piano. And this is called the pianist dystonia. And this also has a whole variety of phenotypical presentations. You can have dystonic extension, you can have dystonic cramping, and you can have cramping of the thumb whenever the patient touches the keys and then starts playing. This is when the dystonic posturing kicks in. Again, sensory input and uh, overflow motor output. And now 
Focal task specific pianist Estonia don't only affect people that can upload their videos on YouTube and uh, tell the world, look, I have focal Estonia. It also happens to very famous people. And this gentleman is called Robert Schumann. And uh, he is a very famous German musician. And he actually has a connection with Vienna because he wrote his thesis here in Vienna. He had to write his thesis here because he was uh, not allowed to do it in Leipzig because um, he had a run in with him, with his uh, later father in law, and the father in law made sure he couldn't do his thesis in like That's why he came here. Anyway, he had a folk with Estonia as well. And when you're a very uh, famous composer and you compose a lot of music, what you can do is you can exclude your dystonic posturing from the pieces you write. And so this gentleman had a dystonic posturing of his third finger in the right hand. And so he wrote this piece, for example, and in the whole piece, no third finger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he was making sure that he put the fourth and the fifth finger here and not accidentally the third and the fourth. So um, he was able to exclude the dys dystonia from his um, writing, from his composing. Other people are less fortunate. This gentleman is called Glenn Gold. He's a very famous musician. Uh, and he didn't write his own music or wasn't famous for it. But what he did was um, he played a lot of Bach uh, and a lot of Bach's uh, music pieces. Now, Bach didn't care about the focal dystonia of Glenn Gold. So Glenn Gold was stuck with whatever was dystonic and couldn't uh, circumvene that at all. But this task-specific dystonia is very prevalent in musicians, and you have a whole variety of other phenotypical presentations, and we just talked about it. Um, one of the audience uh, members has a friend who's got ambrosius dystonia, which is very prevalent um, in uh, brass players. You have the violinist uh, dystonia with the dystonic posturing of the fingers, sometimes with the tremulous dystonia, when the patients uh, touch the bridge, and then the hand would start shaking without them actually wanting to uh, have a tremulous um, sound. We talked about the um, the pianist dyspnea, and we also have that in flutists, and that can actually affect the hands as well as the mouth. So sometimes when the dyspnea hits the mouth, then they can't really put the air properly into the hole. So this is a classic presentation of task-specific dystonias, and this disease is actually a occupational disease, a recognized occupational disease in Germany. I don't know um, how it is in the rest of the world, but in Germany, you actually get compensated if you suffer from a task in Estonia as a professional musician. It also affects other people that uh, do a lot of uh, things repeatedly. And this is a, a picture I, I found on TikTok about a professional gamer. And he had a mouse dystonia. So he was clicking a lot and then his finger got dystonic. And there you can see already what his way of treating his condition was. He changed the sensory input. So he came to realize there was a bad mouse to use. And then he found a different mouse <coughs> was working all right and wouldn't have a dystonic, wouldn't result in a dystonic posture. And this is something that is very critical when you understand dystonias, that the sensory input is very relevant to the setting of the dystonia. And this is also a way of treating it. So, for example, if you have people with a, um, with a dystonic posturing during writing and you take away the sensory input from, their, from the paper, for example, you put them, uh, they have a glove or they have a, a, a cast, then the dystonic posturing doesn't set off that easily. And a beautiful example was in your talk, when you had the patient with the spasmodic dysphonia and you asked him to start talking. And what did he do? He briefly touched his neck and then he could at least start talking. The dystonia was still severe, but he touched his neck and this sensory input changes the sensory um, engram that would set off the dystonia. And this is some, something, and this is why I asked the patient, is there, is there anything that she can do to prevent the dystonia or to reduce the dystonia? And this is what we in neurology call uh, a sensory trick, or in French it's called a geste antagoniste. So you have people with severe surgical dystonia, and what they would, for example, do, they would just touch their, their chin, and that would release the dystonia. You have people with blepharospasm, and they would touch their temple bone, and that would release the dystonia. 
to the extent that some patients that are um, blind because they can't open their eyes, they walk around like this all the time just to be able to see. And this is a sensory treat that's very crucial in treating or uh, is a very pathognomonic feature for uh, dystonias. So now we talked about focal dystonias, and what I want you to understand is that dystonia not necessarily only affects one part. So we've seen focal dystonias, and you perfectly asked the question, do you have any dystonic features anywhere else for the patient that visited? And she didn't. And uh, I want to show you this lady. Um, who has this individual displays what might be called MEJ syndrome? That her mouth is combination of very prominent and forceful well, this, blepharospasm, so as well as irritation of dyskinesia, and is in many such cases associated with. And it was named after this, um, the painter of this a painting. a trick of attempting to get her eyes open simply by placing her hand on her forehead, which is not terribly effective. So the painter of this painting um, is called Peter Bruchel, and so it's actually called Bruchel syndrome. And because nobody knows how to pronounce this name, uh, we thought about a different name, and we luckily found Sometimes another neurologist who was uh, Henry Mej, who uh, now we call this uh, disease after. And this is a, a combination of a blepharospasm or for a mandibular dystonia, and sometimes also associated with the cervical dystonia. And this is not anymore a focal dystonia because we're talking about more than one part. It's called a segmental dystonia. And I'm going to dive into that a little bit later. I also want to show you this gentleman. He's actually a comic uh, writer. And he suffers. You can speak okay to your cat, he suffers as I could. You can do a poem. Sometimes you can sing, very much like a stutterer. But you can't have a normal conversation with a normal person. And you especially can't talk on the telephone. That's just the hardest thing if you have spasmodic dysphonia. Now you can speak okay to your cat and look at his eyes, as I and could. Look at his neck. First you can his do eyes. a poem. Sometimes you can sing, very much like a stutterer. But you can't have a normal conversation with a normal person. Right? And you especially and can't talk on the telephone. That's the just the hardest so thing if you have spasmodic dysphonia. He also has black spasm. And when you look at the video 10 times, then you will eventually see that he also has some dystonic posturing of his neck. So the neck would uh, reverse a little bit, retrocline a little bit. And it also shows you that he has a combination of spasmodic dysphonia, a little bit of mild blackboard spasm, and a little bit of cervical dystonia. And so this is exactly what uh, you should look at when you see patients with spasmodic dysphonia. Ask them for other features. Look at other features. Is their head straight? We couldn't see it in this lady who was here because she was standing like this and talking to you. Usually you would have the patient sit down, look at you straight, have them their eyes closed, and then see what the neck does. And then eventually you would see maybe the neck finds this neutral position where the dystonic muscles pull, and you would you would see that there's an unphysiological position of the neck as a sign, a clinical symptom of a cervical dystonia. So in this gentleman, we have spasmodic dystonia plus blepharospasm and cervical dystonia. So again, a, a segmental dystonia. And we have other body parts that can be affected. And this gentleman has a generalized dystonia, so the whole body is affected. And that can be more pronounced on the upper uh, body part and some dystonias can be more pronounced in the lower body part. And this gentleman has a more pronounced uh, upper How body. From, uh, uh, cerebral palsy. Um, okay, I'll, I'll explain to you. Um, actually, what, what the definition explains it beautifully. In cerebral palsy, you have spasticity. So usually you have an adductor spasticity of the legs and you have a, a, an increased muscle tone. And so patients walk like this, for example, yeah, because they have the severe spasticity. In dystonia, and this is the, the, the last sentence, you usually have an overflow activation. So you have an activation where patients walk like this because they have a hyperactivation of the muscles. 
So you don't only have the rigidity, you have an overflow phenomenon as well, which means you have on voluntary movement, you have too much movement. This is the classical definition of dysphonia. And in the example of spasmodic dysphonia, you have an activation and you have an overflow for the classic type of uh, and adductor dys uh, dysphonia. So uh, we redefined the, the definition of dystonia in 2013, and it now says that it is a either sustained or intermittent uh, contraction of the muscles. It can be repetitive, and um, there's movement, postures, or both. So you can have dystonic posturing, or you can have dystonic movements, or the combination of it. And it usually worsens um, on voluntary action, or it, it can be set up on voluntary action, and it can be tremulous as well. So you can have a patient with a dystonic tremor, and eventually you will find a position where this tremor subsides, whereas a Parkinsonian tremor doesn't subside, regardless how you hold the hand. A dystonic tremor has a null position. That's a classic feature. And now you can categorize dystonias into different axes. You can have a clinical axis uh, depending on the age of onset, the body distribution, and so on. You can have an etiological uh, categorization um, looking whether there's a primary neurodegeneration happening, whether you have any other structural lesions, whether you can have find an inheritance pattern, and so on. And when we look at the age, you see that generalized dystonias are more pronounced in the uh, first two decades, whereas focal dystonia, segmental dystonias come in a little bit later in life. And again, to look at the body distribution, we speak of focal dystonias when only one body part is affected, and uh, segmental when two related body parts are affected, and you can have um, multifocal dystonias that are very rare, and uh, you can have hemidystonias usually with a um, contralateral cerebral lesion, um, and you can have generalized dystonias, uh, DYT6, like this gentleman had, I showed you in the video, or the classic torsion dystonia, DYT1, which is more pronounced in the lower limbs. And for those generalized dystonias, we know um, already that there's a genetic cause. We know that there's for a variety of those dystonias, and I think we're now up to DYT29. Um, we keep on finding um, mutations that affect certain proteins. Um, I just, because we're talking about spasmodic dysphonia today, I want to uh, point out the, the DYT4 and isolated whispering dysphonia. So it's an adductor type dysphonia, which can have an inheritance and in this case, it's autosomal dominant, and we know the alteration. And this becomes um, of interest because we now can have specific genetic therapies or we can introduce vectors um, that can alter the pathologic protein. And so for most of those pathological proteins, we know what they're doing, and we could potentially find uh, those as targets to alter their function and to improve their function. And I'm not going to dive further into that. Um, what we know, uh, and now we come to the pathophysiology of dystonia, is that we have an overflow activation in the basal ganglia. And we can see that here on the left side, we see in the putamen and the parietal areas, a hyperactivation in patients with dystonia, whereas um, in healthy controls, we see a normal um, activation. And in contrast to the hyperactivation, we, however, have a decreased um, dopamine receptor availability in those structures as well. So we see in the putamen, this is patients with writer's cramp, and they were put in a functional MRI and were uh, asked to perform a finger tapping task. And what we can see is in comparison to controls, we see is significantly reduced dopamine um, activation due to a reduced dopamine receptor availability. And how can we put this together? This hyperactivation on one side, but decreased dopamine on the other side. And there is a very uh, complex mechanism of how movement is actually controlled in the um, 
in the uh, basal ganglia. And we have a ex excitatory signal from the cortex that goes into the striatum and in the subthalamic nucleus. And then we have a double cascade of inhibition, which eventually will result in uh, a signal that goes out from the brainstem and the thalamus, and the surrounding areas are inhibited, which is called the surround inhibition. And we also know this from the retina, for example. The retina has the same structure. We know that there's a surround inhibition, and we have a center on cells, center off cells, and we have surrounding on and off cells. And the same structure with a double inhibition is um, happening in the basal ganglia. And so in a normal state, we have an inhibitory output of the colloidal structures into the thalamus and from the substantia nigra into the thalamus, which in patients with dystonia is uh, significantly decreased and thereby explains the overflow phenomenon that we observe clinically. In addition, we see altered corticostriatal synaptic transmission. And um, you might be uh, familiar with long-term potentiation, long-term depression, and this is um, on a neuronal uh, basis, neural structure, how we learn that certain pathways are promoted, others are uh, decreased, and this is achieved with long-term potentiation and depression. And we see in dystonic mice in this example that this is changed. We have an increase in, um, in long-term potentiation. We have um, an um, increase in long-term uh, depression, and thereby the whole learning process is altered and also contributes to this overflow phenomenon that we see. And that, and this is the last slide on pathophysiology, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, just to give you an idea, um, we have a, a hyper-representation of um, um, the cortical areas. And when you now come back to the first videos I showed you, we have professional musicians that repeatedly probably practice four or five hours a day with the permanent sensory input which eventually, if all those other contributing factors are combined, will lead to an enlargement of their cortical representation of their sensory areas, which then will overflow into the motor cortical areas and thereby cause a dystonic action. And we can see that beautifully in patients with Rider's cramp. We have a cortical hyperactivation, and not only on the side that is clinically affected, but also on the contralateral side. Okay, this is enough pathophysiology. Um, how do we treat it? We treat it with botulinum toxin. So we're talking about focal dystonias, and focal dystonias, you can, of course, do physiotherapy, and you can um, try sensory tricks. You should always ask patients whether they see that a sensory trick will uh, improve their symptoms, but eventually you will end up with botulinum toxin. If you have patients with a generalized dystonia, you must um, have a trial of levodopa because DYT5 is a levodopa responsive dystonia and very, very low doses will alleviate the symptoms almost entirely. So this is a must do. If you don't do this, this could potentially have medical legal implications because um, it's called the Segava syndrome. It's a generalized dystonia usually and you will see it usually in children. So you would have children which have trouble walking, you must have a little bit of trouble. And then you have um, anticholinergic drugs, you have um, baclofen as a GABAergic drug, you have um, drugs that interfere on the dopamine <coughs> You have, um, which is tetrabenazine or clozapine, and you have benzodiazepines that also interfere on the GABAergic and transmission and thereby improve dystonic symptoms. Now, this is all um, systemic approaches for more systemic, for more systemic, um, um, or for more generalized clinical presentations. And um, what your line of toxin has the beauty that you can really uh, put it into the dystonic muscles uh, that are affected. If you have someone that's generalized, of course, you would always try to, uh, to put botulinum toxin into the most uh, severely affected muscles, but eventually you will have to go for a systemic treatment approach. And 
Also, those medications have significant side effects, so you're eventually stuck with quality of life. Do you suffer from the side effects but are less dystonic? Probably not eventually totally without dystonia. And uh, we know that um, deep brain stimulation is a very, um, very rewarding um, treatment option for patients with generalized dystonia because it, it helps significantly. And you would have children with severe generalized dystonias that they get operated and they get um, electrodes implanted into the globus pallidus. The globus pallidus is then inhibited by the deep brain stimulation and they can grow up normally without dystonic features. You can adjust the, uh, the deep brain stimulation parameters. This is part one. Any questions so far? Yes. Um, what about for spasmodic dysphonia? Are any of these drugs uh, recommended for spasmodic dysphonia? Uh, well, we tried uh, Nutumano on the spider that was here, and which didn't help. And I think she stopped it because of side effects. And what side effects are mainly? Mainly it's dizziness. And um, they have trouble with accommodation, dry mouth. This is some very significant side effect, but mostly they feel drowsy, dizzy, and sleepy. What about sodium oxybutyrate that has been tried in the US now for subsidy? I had one of my patients that went over there and I just said they tried it, and she swear that it did work for her. What is it? Placebo in yeah, so it looks to be a it's a big thing that I have to use. Okay. And uh, one of the uh, criteria for inclusion is uh, if you are this tool, then it's going to alcohol. I think mm -hmm. you can they take them out, give them out as well. If the system gets better, then they try to do the sodium once you try it to the trial. And uh, she sent me the good of our boys. It's an app that just started on this tool, and it's a high borders. This much and she went to pay on the cell phone. Trust me, I said, There's no, it's not even a thing. I don't know about the chair. Very interesting. Usually, you come to the DBS. No, I'm not going to dive further into DBS. But we probably have some time afterwards as well. Is it possible to recommend uh, um, an antagonistic gesture for uh, spasmodic dysphonia? And so there's a whole there, there was a lot of clinical research how you find a um, sensory trick, and sometimes it helps that you, as the investigator, as the, as the physician, put your hand something. Sometimes that doesn't help at all. Has to be the patient themselves. We have some, we have, uh, there's a video of a patient who had a writer's cramp and then he had an accident, he lost his arm. So he started writing with his mouth and he eventually would develop writer's cramp as a cervical dystonia metastasis. And he would also develop a cervical dystonia, like a phasic cervical dystonia. So, what he, for example, did is he had a chopstick um, under his armpit pointing towards the chin and would always touch his, uh, his uh, chin. chin. So that would prevent him from doing mm -hmm. So the patients are very inventive. Some patients with uh, bless, uh, with lateral spasm would have certain glasses that touch their forehead. Some mm -hmm. patients have uh, a spasmodic, uh, have a task specific dystonia. Um, this beautiful video of a lady who puts on glasses. Mm -hmm. It's a mesh syndrome. And she takes the glasses off and it's gone. And she puts the glasses back on and she takes someone else's glasses and it's not set off. And what it actually was was the ribbon to hold the glasses. Mm -hmm. That sensory trick, that sensory input caused her to be super strong. Without the ribbon, no sorry. And then you wonder, is this psychogenic? Because it is so it's such an unusual presentation and it's ribbon off, no sorry. And so you need to find, you need to ask your patient, did they find a sensory mm -hmm. trick for this? And then you can try, you can try this for spasmodic dysphonia, for example, or you can um, try this for blepharospasm. Usually uh, for a 
uh, focal dystonia, there is some sensory trick that would alleviate the symptoms, not always. Um, how many medical trials you would normally go for a patient? Like this lady was just had to try and get um, Would you have gone for another medication before? Uh, obviously, as for it was working hard. So we were discussing this. I think she would be suitable for deep brain stimulation. I mean, you have uh, you have uh, tried all systemic therapy. You see that uh, that botulinum toxin doesn't alleviate the symptoms well enough for her to regain quality of life. And I think that would be the next step, whether she's willing to, to, to go on, on this journey or not. But I think there's a, a good, uh, um, yeah, I, there's, there's good chances that she has a significant improvement of the symptoms with deep brain stimulation. Okay. That's for her, but generally, when you see a patient, you try one of the drugs. So, do you normally go for a second one, or you see? Yeah, yeah, you go. So, I usually you go um, for so for, for focal or segmental dystonias, you would um, first, I would go for focal and segmental, I would go for botulinum toxin. And if I can't have any symptom alleviation, I would definitely go for anticholinergics and for tetrabenazine. To, um, steps that I would definitely take. Um, you can always try benzodiazepines, but patients they become too drowsy as well. So, and then you are stuck with uh, well, not stuck, but the next therapy option would be brain stimulation. And something that sounds very invasive, it is very invasive, but you wouldn't do it if you wouldn't know of the benefits of it. So, um, there is a considerable alleviation of symptoms with antibiotic stimulation in patients with this. Okay. Now I'm going to show you this lady. So, wie geht's Ihnen heute Morgen so in das Gefühl? So wackelig. So wackelig. Ich habe Luft voll gehabt. Von mir haben wir es. Schon seit Sonntag mit Kids. Ja, okay. Und da ist es kalt, äh, Fieber. We have this lady who's got a very strange voice. She has not a lot of modulation, it's very fixed pitch. And you can also see that she has perioral dystonia and her eyes are a little bit, not really blepharospasm, but you have this central facial dystonic features. Now, in addition, this lady has a slight Parkinsonian syndrome. She also has some cerebellar uh, symptoms. So she was a little bit dysmetric on uh, finger to nose tasks. And she suffered from orthostatic hypertension and she had some voiding difficulties. And as a neurologist, you already have your red flags up. As an ENT doctor, maybe not. But uh, this is a classic uh, symptom constellation for a uh, syndrome called multiple system atrophy. And we're going to dive into that a little bit later. So we're going to talk about laryngeal uh, problems in uh, movement. I'm going to talk about synucleinopathies and just give you a short idea. Um, when we talk about neurodegeneration, we usually have a protein that has a normal structure, which then eventually will change its, uh, its tertiary structure and then accumulate and aggregate, and then usually aggregate either intraneuronally or somewhere in the glia, in the glia cells, and then cause neurodegeneration. And depending on what protein accumulates, we have different diseases. So PDB43 is typical in, uh, in motor neurons disease. The football player we saw before had, has this issue. And we have uh, tau protein and um, beta amyloid in Alzheimer's disease. And we have alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease and related disorders. So this is what we want to talk about for the uh, for the next couple of minutes. And we okay. know that in although we talk about the same protein that uh, aggregates alpha synuclein, it actually looks different in Parkinson's disease and MSA. And while Parkinson's disease is a slowly progressive disease that doesn't um, it's not associated with the reduced life expectancy, MSA is significantly uh, associated. We have a mean survival of seven years after the diagnosis because 
we don't only have the affection of one system, the dopaminergic system, like in uh, Parkinson's disease, but we have more systems, hence the name, multi-system atrophy, uh, which contributes to um, a lot of uh, vegetative symptoms, orthostatic hypertension, voiding difficulties, breathing difficulties, and apparently also laryngeal um, problems. And why is it so important to differentiate those diseases if we can't do anything about MSA anyway? Well, we can, and we're looking at the moment at a variety of therapy strategies to um, clear alpha-synuclein out of the brain. And for this, we need to diagnose those patients early in their course of the disease to promote enough neuroprotection um, that we can actually change the course of the disease. And so what we see in patients with multiple system atrophy is, and up here you see a normal laryngeal function. So during inspiration, you've already heard this, uh, the provo uh, provocative tasks for inspiration and expiration and phonation and sniffing. So inspiration, you see a normal abduction. For expiration, you see a relaxation. Then you see a phonation. <laughs> Phonation, uh, you see a normal abduction of the vocal folds and sniffing a maximum abduction. And in patients with multiple system atrophy, we see a whole variety. We see uh, what, what we call vocal fold motion impairment. So we don't see a full abduction, but we also don't see a full abduction during phonation. Um, we have um, in decreased or absent uh, movement of one um, or in both sides of the vocal folds or we even have paradoxical vocal fold motions. So now we have uh, the patient um, uh, sniff through the nose, we can actually see that the vocal folds adapt to a paradoxical movement. And this is something that we observe uh, in MSA with a very, very high prevalence in Parkinson's disease. Um, almost none of the patients that we investigated had a laryngeal um, motion abnormality. And now when you der Nordwind und die Sonne. Einst trennten sich Nordwind und Sonne. Wer von ihnen beiden wohl der Stärkere wäre? Als ein Wanderer, der in einen warmen Land. Well, to make the long story short, it's a very high strained voice, a little bit fragile, and you could think that it is maybe spasmodic dysphonia and what else to do than a laryngeal EMG. And I was very surprised to not have heard the name Hillel yet, because it's the Bible of laryngeal EMG, yeah. which I learned about seven years ago. And uh, uh, I think Alexander Hillel mm -hmm. um, wrote his thesis on uh, on laryngeal EMG. And what he did is uh, he was crazy enough to find people that uh, allowed him to uh, record laryngeal EMGs simultaneously on eight sides in the larynx. And in contrast to using needles, what he used was hook wire electrodes. And uh, so what he did was he uh, kind of printed the, the physiological pattern of which muscle is active during what task. And this is why we do inspiration, expiration, sniff, and so on, because we know the electromyograph uh, electromyographic um, pattern of those, uh, of those uh, tasks. And of course, the photo from... Uh, from Fabian, the, uh, the graph. And so when we look at patients with uh, multiple system atrophy, what we see is uh, during rest, we see a pseudorhythmic activity in the CATA complex. We also see an activation during inspiration, which is more than the one we see um, during like some physiological activity, but is a more pronounced activity during inspiration. When this mus muscle, should actually be silent because the, only the abductor muscle is active. And the PCA muscle is active during inspiration, but we see a uh, co-activation of the antagonizing muscle, which is very typical for a dystonia. And during phonation, we see a physiological signal. What happens when we look at a different muscle? We look at the PCA. Again, smaller number, but we have some pseudorhythmic activity here uh, at rest. During inspiration, we have an activity. During phonation, we also have an activity. Again, co-activation of two antagonizing muscles, also typical for dystonia. We have this gentleman and, and the cricothyroid muscle. Rest already activity, 
which shouldn't be there. We see during inspiration activity, which also shouldn't be there because what happens is that the CT not only is responsible for the vertical movement of the larynx, is also responsible for the longitudinal tension of the vocal folds. So if we have an activation of the CT muscle during inspiration, we may be responsible, uh, that may be responsible to cause a inspiratory strider. And at low pitch, we have CT activity and high pitch is actually where we would anticipate activity because this is what the what the CT muscle does. And so this is responsible, this tonic activation of the CT muscle for the constant high pitch voice that MSA patients typically uh, present. And when you put this together in a table, we looked at 10 patients altogether, we have a dystonic activation of antagonizing muscles during um, the provocative tasks, which shows that we have some sort of irregular activation of those laryngeal structures. Now, this is something that you can see in any other disease as well. Um, what, we, oops, what we also came across is those movements, and this is at rest. So you look down into the larynx at rest and you see irregular involuntary movements. They're not rhythmic and they're not symmetrical. They're irregular, asymmetric, sometimes left, sometimes to right. And taking that together with the laryngeal symptoms, again, we look at, um, is this something that only happens in MSA? Well, if we compare it to Parkinson's disease, yes. We had one patient um, of the Parkinson's disease cohort, they showed a little bit of vocal fold motion impairment, but in the MSA cohort, those 93% that showed laryngeal um, fun dysfunction, actually the majority, more than 90%, showed this irregular movements. So is that potentially something that would allow us to differentiate those two diseases uh, from one another? And what do you do if you think your cohort is not big enough? You make an international study and you make a bigger cohort actually with the help of Innsbruck as well. And again, we could show that um, if, with a bigger cohort, now we're looking at 166 patients, again, over 90% showed this irregular movements. And we now know how those movements look like. At rest, we know that we have some irregular pseudorhythmic activity at rest is one response for the other would be the questions, and how would you find out? EMG. E EM where we, we, we've done the EMG. Yeah, you match the EMG to the, the laryngoscopy. Well, you do both at the same time, exactly. So we found one patient who was willing to do this. Um, and you see regular activity on the left side. It's synchronous with the... Uh, with the um, that we can record a laryngeal. And it's a very short lasting signal, and it's not typical of a re innovation, it is typical of a myoclonus. And this is something that's been described in multiple system atrophy, also peripherally. So at the hands, you can record myoclonus, you can record myoclonic jerks. The question, though, is we find those irregular movements. Um, independent of the disease duration and the patient's age and the type of MSA the patient is suffering from. And a myoclonus uh, or a myoclonus is, can, can, it can result in a variety of places on the brain. It can have a cortical origin. It can have a, uh, a mesencephalic origin. And we know that very early on in, in the disease, cortical structures aren't affected in multiple system atrophy. So that hints towards a uh, origin probably in the mesencephalon um, where those irregular movements are generated. Now, just a brief uh, excourse on uh, another part of movement disorders, the four repeat tauopathies and why are they called tauopathies? We know a variety of tau pathologies. And um, we're talking here about a certain a certain type of tau protein, which we um, separate in three repeat tau and four repeat tau. And we're talking about this microtubuli binding domain, which can either have three or four repeats. So um, in Alzheimer's disease, we have both tau types and in um, uh, movement disorders associated ones, we 
predominantly find the four of Pitel. That can accumulate um, all over the brain and can then have different phenotypic representations, which I won't dive into detail. But what is very typical is that we have an atrophy that we can see in the mesencephalon. And this is also called the colibri sign. This is why it's called the colibri sign. Mm -hmm. um, and what you sometimes see in those patients. Und sagen Sie mal, ah. This is a palatal myoclonus, yeah? very rhythmic, very classic, and you would usually anticipate a, a disturbance in this Guillain Barre triangle. The Guillain triangle is a connection, um, yeah, I won't read this way, you can all read it yourself, but somewhere in the structure, usually you would find a lesion, and usually it's a strategic lesion after stroke. Um, like in this patient, but uh, we sometimes come across patients that don't have a pharyngeal, a, a palatal myoclonus, like this uh, gentleman had, but we see a pharyngeal myoclonus on the right side, the rhythmic activity. And this patient, in addition, had a supranuclear gaze palsy, like we uh, know from those uh, PSP types or P teropathies. Uh, teropathies. And um, if you look at the um, atrophy where uh, that the patients are affected from, it is in the area where the red nucleus is, which is one corner of this uh, Guillain-Boulari triangle. So it can very well explain why um, there could be a clinical manifestation of a laryngeal myoclonus in those patients. So summing up, what I want you to take home is don't just look at the larynx, look a little bit beyond, ask the patients whether they have any other features. If they have a spasmodic dysphonia, do you play an instrument? Do you sometimes have trouble playing your guitar or your piano? Um, you will have the patient write something down. You will have the patient write just a normal sentence and you will have the patient write a spiral just to see what they finger and doesn't you don't care about what the spiral looks like what you do is you look at the hands you look do the hands cramp up does the contralateral finger cramp up this is all signs of focal <coughs> dystonias so go beyond the larynx look at the whole body ask and talk with your patient ask them whether they have any other features and if you're not sure about any other dystonic features send them to a neurologist Thank you.